Oh, look. Charging goes on. Thank you, so we'll come here if everyone. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. We are waiting for everyone to join. We have a guest with the name P3C74 and so on. Should we let them in? <laughs> Hello. Hi there. I know some people there. We're waiting for everyone to join. Please turn on your cameras. So we will see who you are and say hi to you. Hello, hello. Yaroslav, Samuel, yeah. Are you? I will give people a few minutes to join. Your computer doesn't have a camera. That's fine, Emil. No worries. How about you, P3C74R4? <laughs> <laughs> we have a veritable alien joining us here today. So. <laughs> you may want to rename yourself if you wish, especially if you want to present something today. It, I mean, <laughs> otherwise it will be a bit, you know, too long. <laughs> okay. Okay. So while we are waiting, we have Supraji joining us. Well, oh, thank you, Patrick. <laughs> That's better. That's a bit easier to pronounce. Hello, hello. Hello, Julia. How Hello. are you? Good, good. Great to see you. Thank yeah, you great coming. to see you again. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Or good evening. Hello. It's probably <laughs> good night for you. Good night. Definitely not good morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We don't have everyone, but we have lots of people already. So I think we can have a very quick um, round of introductions. I can start with myself. Uh, my name is Julia Brodsky. I have been teaching astrobiology for about five years now. More than that, eight years. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so um, I was teaching both um, uh, school students and students in the university. And I'm also working on a big book on uh, astrobiology education right now. And together with Dr. Maurer, who is here today, we are um, participating in, at an EPSICON uh, conference. That's a biennial conference supported by NASA on astrobiology. So we're going to learn lots of fun stuff over this week. So we decided that it's not fun if we have only adults participating in astrobiology research. We really need more uh, young people who want to learn more, who want to do something in it. So that's why we are here. This is the first time we are doing this. We are not 100% sure what we are doing. And how <laughs> <we're> doing <Yep. laughs> this is our first try. It's a pilot project. So bear with us. Uh, it, it will grow better, but you are the pioneers of this thing. Okay, Dr. Maurer, do you want to continue? Hi, I'm Dr. Maurer, and I am an astrobiologist that studies the origins of life. Um, I specifically study cell membrane formation and in um, 
non-biotic conditions, so not from biology. Um, and uh, Hansika, you're next on my screen, so I'm going to call you out. Hi, my name is Hansika. I'm a 10th grader, and I'm a rising junior. I worked with Dr. Moore over the summer on a research project of hers. And I like chemistry and biology, and that's why I'm here, and I'm excited to meet all of you today. Sasha, do you want to go next? Okay. Uh, what can I say? I'm this person. I'm really interested in space. I'm a ninth grader over here in the hunk of ice we call Canada. Uh, yeah, I'm just really interested in space and electronics, and I use my knowledge to build interesting stuff. I'll talk a little bit more about it later. We have it in the presentation. Call somebody next. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, next person on my screen is Yaroslav. So. Um, yeah, my name is Yaroslav. Uh, I'm in seventh grade. And I came here just to listen, I think. I don't have anything to present. And uh, I like astronomy and really like biology. So that's kind of the joining place. So wanted to learn more about it because I don't know much about it. Whom do you want to call next? Um, Alexander K. All right. Hi, my name is Alexander. I'm in ninth grade. I am obviously here to present and um, I'm really into astrobiology and all sorts of stuff about space, you know, etc. I think we all kind of get the point of why I'm here. Yeah. And who to call on next? Sarah. Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on. Yeah. Sarah T, I guess. Wait, hold on. Yeah, I guess. Sarah T. Sasha yeah. T. I think oh yeah, Sasha. Sasha. My bad. My bad. Yeah, I already I already did talk, but. Uh, so that's just Sasha's other account. Um, oh. Yeah, that's my that's my other account because I'm recording this meeting as well. So just right. ignore the other Sasha. <laughs> um. Uh, I don't really know who to pick. All right. Uh, Allison. Hi, I am Alexander Kay's mom, and I'm here to observe all these interesting kids and what they have to say about astrobiology. Uh, who hasn't gone? You? Or uh, Daniela? So it is Daniela Billi. Uh, I am a professor at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata, Italy. So it's dinner time for us. And uh, I'm teaching astrobiology and I'm leading the laboratory of um, astrobiology and molecular biology of bacteria. So I'm very curious to see what is going to happen now. <laughs> You're very welcome. We don't know what will happen. This is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's essentially right. It's an experiment. So call on someone now. Any videos? Okay, Samuel. Yep, we can sort of hear you. Uh, you're just really low. Is it better? Hello? Oh, yep, that's better. Uh, hi, my name is Samuel. I'm a, I'm an eighth grader. And I'm not really... I'm not really sure what I'm into, but I'm trying to explore different fields, and I'm kind of looking into... This is kind of... attracted me, you know, because there's so much unknown here. There's so much to explore. I just kind of, Kind of want to listen in and see what this is about. Yep. You go. 
Okay, I guess Hugo is next. Hugo, please unmute yourself. We are unable to hear you. Hello? Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, oh, so how's great. it going? Yeah, sorry, basically I was late. I tried to join, but I don't know why. My, my, cause I was joining from my phone, but it was not working, but um so yeah i didn't i missed out on the on the beginning of the presentation but um yeah so what are we doing julia so just presenting myself and what, what, what i do yeah just yeah. very quickly like you know one minute tell yeah, yeah very shortly yeah. Yeah. okay so um okay so basically i um am a talent specialist working within the space industry so essentially i help uh, founders of space companies find the people that they need to put their satellites in space. So um, very quickly, satellites or whatever, you know, experiences they are doing. Um, and yeah, that's what I specialize on. So um, if you guys have any questions um, about, you know, the future of, you know, accessing, you know, having a better chance of uh, getting a, a job, your first job in space and so on, feel free to ask me any questions and, you know, I'm happy to, to help you out or give some tips for, you know, things that you could do um, in order Thanks. to maximize your chances. Thank you, Hugo. Uh, yes, you can. Um, my name is Yashka and I'm a 10th grader. In um, I'm currently studying with Dr. Graham and we're planning a project on using elemental balances on other planets to detect biosignatures. And this has been a topic that's really interested me for the past couple of years because I'm really into astronomy and biology and like combining those things is what is really cool to me. Thank you. Uh, Bill? If I pronounce your name correctly. Yeah, you pronounce my name correctly. Uh, hi, I'm Bill. Uh, I'm an observer for today's session. And if you can observe, my eyes are a bit aching because I, okay, just anyways, it's currently 2.30 a.m. in the Philippines right now. And I just had a quick nap because I'm currently working on a systems engineering assignment. And a little bit about myself, I am currently a sophomore student studying biology here in the Philippines. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Patrick. Hello. <clears throat> My name is Patrick Westro. I'm a ninth grader in Michigan. I'm going into 10th grade. Um, I've been very interested in astronomy for many years, and I also um, really enjoy biology. And when I saw the two were in astrobiology, I wanted to look into it. Yeah, this is a good group of people. Uh to meet and to ask questions. Absolutely, yes. And uh, Suprajit. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Suprajit Barua and I'm a second year PhD student in biotechnology with an interest in food biotechnology and especially space food, uh, developing sustainable agricultural systems and methods. And besides academia and research, I'm also interested in education and outreach. And as a result of that, I am currently the co-lead of the mentoring committee at SGAC, that is Space Generation Advisory Council, where we connect mentors and mentees from all over the world. So uh, to foster space education, to grow this network, to know each other, because that's how I got introduced into this field. Today, you're seeing Julia and you are learning from her. My journey also started quite the same from RTF Inquiry and other organizations where I learned from great experts and great minds like Julia. And I understand the value of such networks, such learning. So now I want to foster and help you guys also to get connected with some great mentors out there. I already see some of you are already connected. So I'm pretty happy to see all of you here, the enthusiasm, the excitement about this field. And I am sure we will have a very healthy discussion and many great ideas going forward. So I'm pretty excited for today's meet. Thank you so much, Suprajit. So this uh, meeting was planned and uh, developed by Hansika and Sasha. So Hansika and Sasha will now share their screen, tell you a little bit about how we are going to go and the order of presentation. And we will start. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I also, uh, I think we already covered 
most of it, so most of it will be just a repeat, but nevertheless, uh, give me a sec. Of course, screen sharing on screen sharing on Linux is a bit of a pain, but yeah. <laughs> There we go. So, uh, yeah, as everybody said, uh, welcome. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Um, I'm sure we'll have a really great discussion, as Prashid said. So, uh, yeah, uh, this was made really possible by quite a few people. So I want to say thanks. Uh, yeah, as Prashid said, I think uh, to great minds like uh, Julia Brodsky, Dr. Sarah Moore. Uh, Julia is currently uh, fighting courageously with hotel Wi-Fi in Providence at the actual AppSycon conference. So yeah, thanks for coming. And to everybody else, thank you so much for carving a little chunk out of your day to come and listen to some and discuss some astrobiology. Um, yeah, thanks all to our lovely uh, judges and people who are listening in as well. Uh, you should also, by the way, you should probably also come to the May 5th session if you're interested, where we'll have actually more of an open discussion with scientists and we'll have sort of, if you're interested in meeting sort of leading experts in the field and sort of asking your questions and having more open discussion, uh, that's what we'll be having tomorrow from uh, 7 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern. So Hansika, you should probably expand on that. Ooh, a quick overview of the agenda. Everyone who's going to present is going to present for like three to five minutes. And the way it's going to work is at four minutes, we'll just give you like Hey, you have one minute left, and at five minutes, we'll just let you finish your thought, and we'll move on to the next person. Yeah, and, and then we'll... we'll... Somebody... Oh, sorry. No, oh, continue. Sorry. <laughs> and when everyone's presenting, please just be mindful and make sure you're muted. And pay attention so you can ask some reflective questions and comments. Yeah, and um, we'll probably discuss after each presentation for like three minutes. Uh, if you do go over five minutes, like six minutes, it's fine. If you have, if you go and expound your awesome idea, but uh, try to keep it. I uh, try to finish before you're in third year university. So, yeah, uh, etiquette stuff like that. Hence it go. <laughs> Some of this is just like a repeat, basically. Like, be respectful, pay attention, ask questions, try to keep between the three to five minutes. We won't like cut you off. But we would be very grateful if you guys could stick between these boundaries. Mm -hmm. Remain yeah. muted when you're not speaking. And contact either either one of our emails. Um, we'll put it in the chat if you cannot rejoin and you just need some help or if you need something. And last but definitely not least, have fun. And I hope you guys learn a lot. Yeah, if you have issues, just drop us a line in the chat. We'll, some will probably be able to help you. Uh, yeah, as for, uh, I mean, we had a section here for introductions, so I guess we could still do that. Uh, all I can say is, yeah, I mean, you already heard a lot a lot about me, but uh, I got my amateur radio license a while back, so I'm really interested in sort of telecommunications and stuff like that. Uh, I've been doing some balloon projects. Um, I've been working on some sort of embedded uh, microcontrollers, microcontrollers and stuff like that for these balloon missions. This is one of the images that it returned. Um, so yeah, I'm also more related to SETI and sort of astrobiology. Uh, I've been working on sort of uh, backyard radio telescope for a few months. This is an old photo, so it looks much better now. But nevertheless, um, there's no feed mounted on here onto the dish, but it's there now. And um, I've been also interested in writing a lot of software for that stuff. So yeah, that's essentially me. Uh, and Sika, do you want to just talk about this? Yeah. So. I'll be talking more about this later, but this is basically a quick, it's basically just something I did while I was in Dr. Moore's lab over the summer. I'm going to be talking more about it at the end. So a little bit about me is, as I said before, I'm in 10th grade. I like chemistry and biology. I do, I do a lot of writing things with science. Like I love to do research and writing. That's my sort of thing. Um, and I'm excited to hear what everyone has to say. Yeah, uh, I think so with that, here we go, uh, essentially. Uh, Christopher, I think you're up first. Christopher, 
or not. I, I guess not. Julia, you're muted. I, I don't think we have Christopher here. Yeah. So Alexander is next. Yeah, Alexander is next. So. All right. Uh, feel free to share your screen. All right. Just give me a moment. Um, all right, so the topic I chose was, uh, it's the idea of a habitable epoch, epic, I don't really know how to pronounce it. I like to think of it more as like the Goldilocks universe, as the idea that the entire universe was kind of like the Goldilocks zone of a star. So what is it? Uh, it's the idea that very early after the universe was uh, like when the Big Bang happened, there was a point when it would have been just the right temperature for liquid water, whether that be uh, out in space in blobs or on other objects. Uh, it would have been very shortly after the Big Bang and it would have not lasted very long. And so very, there's the potential that very basic life could have formed early in the universe. When would it have been? It would have been uh, about the first 100 million years with the first and second generation of stars. There would have been a point early where it was the right temperature, as I've said, uh, at the earliest 15 million years. And there would have been an 85 million year period where there was enough time for it to happen. And moving on, the Paradox of life. So life uh, evolved, kind of appeared really quickly on Earth, like almost at the same time as water, 1.3 billion years after uh, the Earth had formed with water. And it was already comp like decently complex, a uh, lot of microorganisms that were advanced, not super advanced, but like they would have taken too long to have just popped up. It's like they doesn't, it's not possible. And so the potential is maybe the first steps of life happened early in the universe and they went dormant. It just, it kind of, like a water bear, it went dormant and just kind of went into a dormant state. And just by chance, whether it be by meteorite or by some other random chance, it found its way to a early earth with water. And uh, the earth was able to give it the environment it needed to continue to thrive from where it had already taken its first steps. Thank you. This is such a cool hypothesis. I really, really like it. And I really like that you have your resources here listed as well. Yes, yes. Dr. Moore, do you want to say something? Uh, I guess the... <laughs> Hey, Artie, please be quiet. They have a question that is kind of fun to think about, which is if you had one, if you could know one thing or if you had one resource available to you for your research, what would you like to have? Um, and I think obviously a time machine would be really helpful for this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have no way of actually telling what was there, what elements and all that kind of stuff. It's just a hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, but thinking about how you could explore it is kind of a fun, fun thought yeah. experiment. Or just the idea of what would it even look like? Uh, the question is, we can't, don't have a time machine, but can we simulate that environment? Uh, I'm sure there is a way to simulate it. That would be really cool to simulate. It would, it. This yes. will be such a cool scientific project. I would really love to see it happening. Yaroslav, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, so can I ask a question about this theory? Uh, of course. I thought, so in the period of time where you mm -hmm. think the water would be like good to sustain the basic basic life, um, after the Big Bang, wouldn't, you, how would that work if like, do you think the Big Bang produced only hydrogen and helium at the start? Or did uh, it produce all elements? 
At the start, yeah. it would have only produced hydrogen and helium, but the first and second generation of stars that came shortly afterward did produce the elements necessary for life. And there is a very small period in the universe where there would have been a good crossover between liquid water being anywhere and there being the right elements necessary for the first steps of life to happen. Cool. Mm-hmm. So it, it happened um, after a few or like two or one generations of stars yes. had already gone through. Okay. Cool. Which were, they were very short generations. They yeah. Uh, they burned through their elements very quickly. Yeah. Massive. Um, any other questions to Alexander before we move on to the next presenter? I would just um pitch, quickly pitch in something. It's not a question, but like a food for thought, Alexander. Um, if we try to think beyond water as a medium of life, what if uh, water is not the only medium necessary for life, but it can be some other compounds? And if we think like that, it just broadens our horizon and we start to imagine different time zones it just gets bigger so i would like to know what you think and maybe we can uh, have more uh, inputs from everyone from we have some great experts as well so it's just an idea yeah all right i think that's actually i think that's actually interesting because you would have to have for example more than just habitable uh, like water at liquid temperatures around for life to be able to form of course of course which is uh why I kind of talked about the first and second generation of stars producing other elements like carbon and uh, sulfur, a bunch of other elements necessary to form life. Like I didn't specifically mention elements, but those first generations of stars, specifically the second generation did create those elements needed aside from the liquid water that would be a medium for the life to form. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, who is next? Good question. Um, Adam Sika, can you can you look? It doesn't seem to want to be working for me. Yeah, I'll look. Give me okay. okay. The next person is Alexander Kalinin. No, no, that's the one that just. What? <laughs> oh. <laughs> this brain. Merman Raymond. That's the here. third person. Oh, okay. Um, Peter Alstadt. Yeah, I wonder where Peter is. Uh, I can ping um, him. Is he in the meeting? No, he is. Um. The next person is. Yeah, okay. to abolish the money. Yeah. So yeah, so um, Yashka, yeah. Do you want to present your slides? Mm-hmm. Um, let me share my screen. Real quick. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, it looks good. All right, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, my name is Yashika, and for my project, I'm trying to come up with a novel method of using elemental abundances on planets to detect biosignatures. Um, this slideshow will basically just be a proposed methodology. I don't have any current results from my research yet, but these will be the methods that I use over the summer while I work on my project. So let's start off with the question, what is life? This question has intrigued scientists since the dawn of time. From Renaissance scientists like Copernicus and Galileo to modern NASA missions searching the cosmos with the James Webb Telescope trying to find some indicator of life. But what would we use as this indicator of life? The answer isn't so simple. If we manage to find life, it likely won't be a tiny green humanoid creature waving back at us. What we're trying to look for are biosignatures, which are indicators of life. But if we're looking for biosignatures, what exactly are we looking for? The Redfield Ratio might be able to help us. Alfred Redfield observed that the molar ratio of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus in phytoplankton is the ratio of 106 to 16 to 1, and it is, on average, the same across all of the oceans. But wait, if the Redfield ratio is plankton, which is found in the ocean, how are we tying this to astrobiology? In astrobiology, the search for extraterrestrial life heavily relies on identifying biosignatures in the chemical composition of other planets. 
The Redfield Ratio, as a well-established concept in marine biology, can serve as the foundation for understanding the elemental balances necessary to support life elsewhere in the universe. By examining the elemental ratios on exoplanets, we can search for patterns similar to the Redfield Ratio, potentially indicating the presence of life, or a mixture of elements that could support life. In order to understand this, I started my research with Dr. Kempe's paper. Um, it talks about developing models that can predict elemental ratios and potential alien life forms, which could then be compared to the environment as a biosignature. This would allow detecting life that, might, that may not share Earth's biochemistry, which is important for exploring planets further away where life likely arose independently. Um, the next article shows that the chemical imbalance in Earth's atmosphere and oceans increased during major rises in Earth's in oxygen levels caused by life, such as the Great Oxygenation Event, when oxygen-producing bacteria like cyanobacteria became widespread, which ties back into our Redfield Ratio. This led me down the path. There aren't currently any ratios like the Redfield Ratio that exist beyond Earth. So my goal is to help to improve my understanding of this. Um, working with my mentor, I want to learn how we can bridge the gap between elemental ratios and extraterrestrial life. How exactly can we do this? It was hard enough for Alfred Redfield to do it for just one planet, so how exactly can we do it for hundreds and thousands of planets? Thankfully, we have something that he didn't. More data that's come from space exploration, which will help me immensely with data collection. And like almost everything else in science, it has to start with data collection. I plan to use catalogs like the Hypatia Catalog and Extrasolar Encyclopedia, as well as data from telescopes like JWST and Kepler. Um, after that, um, we'll put it all on a table, um, like the one showed. This is just an example table, um, so it'll be easier for our next step. Another tool that Alfred Redfield didn't have that we have is artificial intelligence. And I propose to train an AI chatbot with my data sets and use something called LangChain to analyze and find patterns among these massive amounts of data. Um, so LangChain is basically a framework, which means it's a set of tools and libraries that make it easier to build applications and services. LangChain is specifically designed for working with large language models, or LLMs, which are trained deep learning models that can understand and generate text in a human-like fashion. With LangChain specifically, we can train LLMs to analyze the massive sets of planetary data that we give it. So that's how the whole methodology would work. Um, but why is this so important? Why would tying the Redfield ratio with extraterrestrial life be such an important concept? One of the main things is that space exploration is incredibly expensive. There's only a limited amount of resources available to explore exoplanets, and it's a better idea to be able to pinpoint planets that have a higher chance of having life. And this sort of ties into future research. We might be able to discover a new generation of planets, but we might also be able to discover a new generation of life forms. Think of all the possibilities that this could bring. We can discover and learn so much about planets out there and what it means to be alive. Um, thank you for listening, and may the fourth be with you. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah. That was a very detailed presentation. Thank you. Wow. It was really good. Thank you. This is perfect. Yes. Uh, so um, this is so cool to use AI uh, to look for the patterns and actually uh, shift, you know, sift through, through all the data. Um, we're able to... Um, even st I, have you started doing it? Do you have some sample results, like preliminary results? Or? Not yet. I'm planning on starting like after May because APs are coming up. So I'm planning on starting Hopefully. a little bit later. But yeah, I'll, I'll hopely start soon. Yeah. Sasha has something to say yeah. about the uh, exams, I think. <laughs> uh, about the exams, yeah. yeah. That's the only reason I can't really go to AppCycon right now. But um, yeah, I actually had uh, another question. So um, I don't know much about neural networks, but why would you want to use um, my true sense or like why would you want to use large language models like LLMs when you would rather be probably better off using something closer to image recognition or to find patterns and data because you're after all you're not really dealing with probabilities and uh how likely a word is supposed to be placed after one other word you're sort of uh dealing with more uh numerical data that's true um but LLM specifically the ones that i use like langchain um i find it to be a little bit better in analyzing those numerical datas um i started working with it but yeah, that is something I definitely am looking to explore, like the different types of options that I can use when analyzing the data. Okay, cool.
other questions? Well, I, ha I, have, I have a question. How did you like come up with this? Like, I want to know, like, what was your thought process of like coming up with this idea and like the way that you solved it? Uh, it was like a large like rabbit hole. Like when I was first thinking about like this project, I was thinking about something totally different. I was actually thinking more of like the origins of life kind of thing. And then um, I was speaking to Dr. Graham and she said that it might be helpful to find our origins of life by looking at the cosmos, by looking at other planets. Um, so that's how this kind of led me down that path. And I've always been interested in astronomy. So it was like an easy way to tie those two together. Interesting. I just looked through the source code on for Langchain on GitHub. Uh, it looks pretty cool. Uh, I'm gonna have to look into it. it. Looks great. Patrick, Samuel, do you have questions? Deal. Uh, I currently don't have any questions right now. I I have one. Um, so about the bio signatures. Why do you want to use this ratio? I didn't totally understand that. And are there other types of bio signatures that you can search for as well? Yeah, so currently the bio signatures that scientists are looking for are things like water. Um, if you've seen in the news, um, Kepler K218b, um, they found, they thought they found water on the planet, but it turned out to be methane. So water is one of the biggest bio signatures that they're using. And since the Redfield ratio is an established concept on Earth, we know that life on Earth's oceans follow this set of ratios. It'll be easier to look for these ratios on other planets as a potential indicator of life. Dr. Moorer, what would you say? Um, I, I mean, this is a thing that we think about a lot. And so I think this is a good approach uh a lot of our for the astronomists in the room a lot of our approach is limited by what we can see spectrally and so this is a nice approach because um you might be able to resolve phosphorus spectrally with like james webb or even maybe some land-based telescopes like the big ones um so there's some cool opportunities with existing technology alexander I don't see anymore there. What would you say about this? How do you like this approach? I don't hear you. <laughs> Hold on, sorry. I was just fixing my microphone. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so what was the question again? Uh, would you add something to this? If you were to approach this question uh what what else could you suggest what else would i suggest yeah for, um for, for looking for biosignatures on other planets uh i noticed that you were looking for signatures of water uh but as was all so mentioned and what i was saying water isn't the only thing necessary yeah i'm not looking for water i'm looking oh. for yeah, I'm looking for yeah. the red field ratio. So carbon, nitrogen to phosphorus. So those right. are the three things. Yeah. Right. All right. Why do you think this is the only ratio that can indicate? Oh, that's ratio? actually a great question. It's not the only ratio, but it definitely serves as a starting point since it's we know for life on Earth that it's a very well established concept. Um, it can serve as a starting point when we look for life on other planets. Obviously, life on other planets may be different from our own life, but if we have some indicator or some baseline to go off of, it'll be it'll be useful. Thank you, thank you, Daniela. Yeah, yeah, I think this is a very nice approach because he's uh, looking for uh, what is really a prerequisite for life so elements uh, and with water no if we look for life as on earth so it's uh, maybe it is not really as biased signature of life but it looks to me more like a prerequisite for life it means like to see what it is potential habitable because uh, when i think to biosignature of life i'm thinking to 
oxygen, methane, uh, so biomarkers in the atmosphere, or um, look into morphological biosignature that, of course, we could not have on uh, exoplanet or complex molecules that uh, cannot be formed by abiotic, uh, or let's say, formed by chemical ways, but only thanks to biochemistry, so formed by cellular life. So, but I really think that the ratio uh, between elements is really a good strategy to see what is potentially habitable, of where life potentially could uh, uh, exist. Thank you. <laughs> is it something, Danielle, that your students are thinking of? Is it an approach that they are thinking of? Uh, we are I'm working on cyanobacteria, so we are very much uh, interested in oxygen. So also we are using cyanobacteria that are able to um, drive photosy oxygenic photosynthesis using uh, um, far red light or um, let's say infrared light. So since uh, a lot of stars has a spectrum that are shift in the infrared, it's really really very interesting that on Earth there are uh, a few cyanobacteria that can use uh, non visible life, uh, not visible light for photosynthesis, so oxygen. And uh, we are also working on complex uh, molecules, uh, like uh, molecules that maybe we could find on samples that will be retrieved from Mars. So what is left from dead uh, microbes, let's say. Sounds really cool. Ask uh, Prajit. Yeah, so it's a really wonderful approach and I'm really intrigued by this discussion. Something that came to my mind while listening to everyone is that this composition of elements are dynamic in nature on Earth as well. If you look into the past, the percentage of oxygen and everything was different than because of uh, as time passed, it changed. And now we have the, a particular percentage, a particular composition that shoots this form of life. But we don't know, again, in the future it might change and life would adapt, I suppose. So keeping that in mind would also be interesting because I, right now the, when you pinpoint the, a particular ratio, I think you are particularly targeting one particular type of life form. But um, if you play around with the ratios, maybe you you might get some interesting hits and you might discover some different types of life that can be in their early stages, in the most thriving stage like Earth now or maybe like a futuristic stage that we don't have an idea. So yeah, really cool project, really cool uh, ideas and it has a lot of potential, I would say. Thank you. That's I'll, I'll definitely look into it, that different ratios. Um, one thing I was thinking of ratios from like early Earth when we didn't have all of this blooming life around us because the life would have probably caused the phosphorus to shoot up. So I'll definitely look into comparing ratios from early Earth to present Earth and maybe even future Earth. But yeah, thank you. Well, we have several presenters who confuse the time zones so and even days. So yeah. <laughs> that's why we have only two presenters here. I, I got two emails as we were talking. People saying, oh, no, I completely forgot. I completely confused. I thought it's another day or another time. Things happen. Yeah, uh, but I just sent an email to Adam. So hopefully he might come. But OK, OK, so we may Otherwise, I have Hansika if you want to talk a little bit about everything. Yes. Sure, sure. So maybe Hansika can talk a little bit about her research, and then you, Sasha, talk a little bit more about your balloons, um, stratospheric balloons, uh, and other stuff. And you have your presentation on James Webb, Sasha, as well, right? Somewhere. Oh, man, that was from a long time ago. Yeah. So... Yeah, well, let's just not talk about that one. Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. I'm happy to present. Okay. Thank you. Sasha, could you present my the slide? Because oh, it's okay. the last slide of my Give me a second. presentation. Yeah. Getting there. All right, that should work. Or not? Uh, 
I think that this is the issue where when you go into presentation mode, it doesn't actually display. I've seen this a lot. Um, oh, and so I don't know. It was before, so no. I think it's just an issue with it doesn't. I uh, wonder if it's an issue with Firefox because it loves doing that. Um, give me a sec. Okay, maybe this will. I can work. present it. Okay, yeah, great. There you go. Okay, so this was the research that I was doing in Dr. Moore's lab, and I was working on a part of the project. So basically for mine, I was testing vesicles in like samples. And I tested 26 samples. And out of that, I found 60 over a little bit over 60% had vesicles and 38.5% didn't. And on the right side, you're going to see one of the vesicles I took with my phone. And one of these, one of the things that I had to do during this experiment well, they had to differentiate between like oil droplets and vesicles, which could be a little bit hard to identify. And for the method, I took 10 microliters of the sample and then two micro type microliters, sorry, two microliters of the Nile red dye. And then I used microscopy to see if there were vesicles or not. And then on the right side, you'll see all the samples which had vesicles. And yeah. I am really well, sorry. I think I've uh, uh, missed it. Um, what are you checking? What kind of liquid are you checking? Uh, and why are you checking this liquid? Yes, and why are you looking for vesicles specifically? Yeah. Um, vesicles is like a sign of life. And my part of, my part of the project was like microscopy. So I was basically looking for life in these samples. The samples of what? Where does the liquid come from? Um, Dr. Moore, I yeah. am not completely aware. The um, proline and alanine are PNA, so they're amino acids. And then um, with an alcohol, like decanol or octanol. And so it's a mixture of organics that um, when they react, sometimes they form vesicles and sometimes they don't. So the goal is, do I understand correctly, just a second, uh, do I understand correctly that when we combine some organic molecules, some amino acids with water, at times they form something, little bubbles, and uh, those bubbles um, are kind of like early protocells, um, and this is what you are looking for, for some bubbles that can actually serve as a protecting environment for early uh, uh, molecules to be stored and organized inside those bubbles. So those serve like cell membranes in a sense. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's correct, Julia. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yashika, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, do you think that, I'm just like thinking about a the signature from earlier, but do you think that this could be like an indicator of life? Because I think you might have mentioned earlier that because like vesicles are an indicator of life, do you think that this could be yeah. like other planets potentially? Um, I'm not sure if it would extend to other planets. I Vesicles are a sign of life. Dr. Moore, vesicles are a sign of like general life, like just life in general, correct? Uh, all life that we know has cell membranes. So mm -hmm. we think that it's a prerequisite for life to be enclosed in some kind of container. So yeah, yeah this has been talked about as a possible biosignature, um, and especially when we're thinking about sending dragonfly to Titan and weird life. If we see little cells floating around in in the methane lakes um it's a pretty good indicator that there's something else going on and this actually takes us back to alexander's presentation <laughs> and to your presentation yashika because when we are talking about titan we are talking about non-water non based life but it still may be life and um we still think that something like cells will form the basis of that life, even though those 
vesicles will not be filled with water, but rather with liquid methane or some other liquid. So um, figuring out, uh, finding out whether there are vesicles in different uh, materials would be very important when we will be looking for potential life. Non-liquid world. Yes. Someone has a uh, noise in the background, please. It's you Sasha. Know. Okay, Sasha, mute yourself. Uh, Suprajit, you, you, yes. you had it. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, so this uh, research is really interesting because it reminds me of the biogenesis theory, how inorganic and organic compounds really formed and they formed conservates and vesicles like this to actually protect all the macromolecules. Uh, I just wanted to know that from studying these uh, uh, formation of vesicles and non-vesicles over time, could you identify or were you able to identify any particular parameters under which they form vesicles or if those parameters are a little bit disturbed then they don't form vesicles is this like um you know like how to say it's like controlled by some parameters or it's very much chaotic and random the ones that i found that usually had vesicles usually had precipitate in them and there's like other slides which I have, which covers a little bit more about this. I don't really know on the top of my head, to be honest. That's what I had. And I had a journal that I kept all of my data collection in. And I do remember there were a few. And I do remember precipitate was one of them. Daniela? Yeah, if I may add something, yeah, I like this experiment and I uh, was thinking about some experiment that has been done long time ago and adding water to some chondroitic meteorites and they found this vesicle. So it's really like uh, going back to the origin of life and how we could have the compartmentalization of uh, amino acid or RNA, so just the very, very step, uh, the very first step of molecular life and cellular life, you know, so just that moment uh, where you start to have the compartment, the, the, so the, the first uh, form of life, so yeah, very nice experiment. Abiel, do you want to say something? No, I don't have something to say. Uh, okay, so Hansika, uh, should we switch to Sasha now? Yeah. It's Thank Sasha. You. Thank um, you. Okay. Or not. You can't hear me. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, that's good. Um, let's see. So I actually wasn't really planning on doing the presentation. So I can talk through a school presentation that I wanted to do, but I never ever ended up to doing, but it's quite a bit longer than five minutes, probably around 20 minutes. So I can just give everybody a really quick rundown um, of what what it was. You um, can keep some slides. So just yeah, yeah. so I can the make this work. Uh, so basically, the idea was so basically the idea was um, to have a high altitude balloon with which are essentially gigantic balloons that are really stretchy that are filled with a lot of gas and be able to take pictures of the uh, upper stratosphere in this case. In this case, we actually didn't achieve um, 20 kilometers because we lost contact with the balloon before it reached that point. But uh, the last known picture was at around 17 kilometers. Uh, but they usually do rise to about 20 to 40 kilometers above ground level. So um, you can use them as a sort of a testing tool for exploring space and testing your satellite before they actually, before you actually spend like 30,000 on a rocket launch in order to actually get it there. So let's see what's standing in our way. Yeah, these are just some issues that um, uh, that you can incur upon yourself when you're doing stuff like this. For example, um, uh, a lot of people don't like balloons crashing into their airplanes, especially while they are in the airplanes. So a lot of the time you need uh, notice to airmen 
in Canada, you actually don't need notice to come in because I'm assuming it's a very much of a legal gray area, but um, based on the few documents that we do have, uh, they're essentially assuming that uh, jet turbines will be able to handle it, but we're nice people, so we uh, so we file notice to airmen anyways. Um, and there are other issues which are sort of like COCOM limits where you would have a GPS receiver that is unable to output data when it's larger than 18 kilometers, which is an issue because we're going much farther than 18 kilometers, we're going up to about 40. So uh, the some GPS receivers, they actually support bypassing these, so uh, whenever I use designs, I do uh, stuff in, uh, I buy specific GPS receivers that are able to receive higher altitudes. Uh, okay, uh, frequencies and stuff like that, but this was the actual payload that went up. This is an old, um, this is an older version of it, so uh, I've got a much better, I'm working on a much better design right now, so this was the first test flight of it. But there was essentially a little GPS, we had a transmitter on there with a camera and some custom firmware that I wrote and a printed circuit board that I designed with a lithium battery. Um, so yeah, the launch was essentially um, quite nice. Essentially the only thing that I messed up was I tied in the parachute incorrectly, so our ascent rate ended up being much, much slower than expected. This was launched uh, last March. Uh, well, not last March, this March, sorry. Um, March 29th. So the first image we got down from the system was this. Uh, when we uh, slowly we got an aerial view of the city and then we climbed higher and higher with the balloon until we ended up in sort of more or less s satellite space territory. So this was about 17 kilometers and then right after that we actually crossed the US, uh, the Canada-US border and a few minutes after that we lost communication. So I have no idea what happened. No conspiracy theories but uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not really sure what happened there. So. Whatever it is, I'm hoping that there would be a better, uh, I'm working on engineering a better version of the printed circuit board and stuff like that. Um, yeah, this was the actual, this was the actual flight graph and the GPS over here. This is how it looked like. Um, this was, uh, this was the ascent rate and we had issues a little bit with GPS and the ascent rate of the actual balloon. Uh, so I don't have it on here. Oh yeah, also all the firmware and hardware, it's up on GitHub if you want to take a look at it, but I don't have it on the slideshow because this is supposed to be a school slideshow. But imagine if we could, as uh, Julia suggested, imagine if, if we could use stuff like this for sample return missions on Mars or any time where we essentially need to descend, grab something, and then inflate, inflate uh, and then inflate a balloon and they'll essentially go back up. And we don't really need anything that we don't need stuff like helium, which is expensive to bring, because a lot of planets have different atmospheres. So there would be would be able to afford essentially heavier gases that uh, wouldn't really normally work on Earth, but would work in such scenarios on other planets. Um, so yeah, that's essentially all I've got to say. Unfortunately, it wasn't a very well timed presentation, but that's essentially that. I think it's a very cool one, especially given that I'm now going to work on Mars sample return. I think it may be such a great idea to suggest to them. So I I'll definitely will. Okay. <laughs> NASA says we need some out of the box thinking for Mars sample return. So I'm definitely- uh, gonna... And a lot of money from Congress as well, which is definitely <laughs> happening right now. That's true. Okay. Comments on Sasha's um, balloons going into stratosphere on different planets. Yeshika? I think that it's like just generally like a really cool concept and I think it could like go very far. Like I actually, it's it's really cool. Um, yeah, I think yeah, that's it. But I just want to say I thought it was like pretty cool. Great. Um, yeah, I think it's really awesome. It took me about a year to actually get all the hardware working and it was insane uh, it was really difficult so um i'm glad it all worked out in the end and i'm sure it'll be even more difficult on mars and other planets where you don't have direct access to the actual launch equipment yeah i enjoy the presentation oh sorry, oh, sorry. i enjoy the presentation it was really interesting listening to your what's like what exactly like made you want to do this um 
being bored during COVID and trying to figure out what to do, and then finding uh, the United Kingdom Pilot Society website, which, ha which hasn't been updated since 2013. They're no longer doing any sort of flights, but nevertheless, all the documentation on there made it uh, much easier to actually gain the knowledge quick enough to be able to do something like this. Yeah. I'll say that's the most reasonable <laughs> why I started this November. Yeah. We were all bored during COVID. Mm -hmm. So, Prajit. Yes, yeah, Sasha, really cool work done, and I have been tracking your some of your works for a long time. They're really uh, very cool, very amazing. Um, I was just brainstorming the idea of sending these balloons farther and to even possibly to different planets, as you mentioned. I think uh, one of the things that we should definitely look into is developing materials to make balloons that can survive through this long <laughs> journey, survive through the different uh, condition beyond our atmosphere, beyond the, the far outer space. And that would be a cool dimension to really look into what sort of materials can be used to survive such uh, spaces. And that opens like a new area to think about for material scientists and students who are learning about chemistry and material science. I think it's really cool. Yeah, that's actually an interesting aspect I didn't think of because um, a lot of, as far as I'm aware, PVC, I, I could be wrong, but I think PVC in space does not do really well. So especially uh, many, many satellites failed simply because of having like, PVC wires inside, I think. and didn't really work out. So I'm wondering whether or not stuff like, because balloons like these are made out of latex, like really stretchy latex. So I'm wondering whether or not latex might be an issue in, for example, Titan's atmosphere where you have whatever the number is, um, really, really crushing pressure. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, the atmospheric pressure is the main, is the key factor here, because on Earth, the atmospheric pressure it balances and keeps it keeps it inflated but when you go to a different planet or to a different region and the atmospheric pressure changes uh, we have to like make it uh, customized in a way that it can adapt probably to the varying atmospheric pressures mm -hmm. so that it can still stay inflated and does not Actually, be inflated. an idea there because when balloons these balloons like these they rise up you have latex which stretches out and the only thing that makes it stretches because your atmospheric pressure goes down. So if you have a much higher atmospheric pressure that's pushing back on the balloon, you should be able to achieve a much higher altitude first before it bursts, which is actually a really interesting idea. Yes, Dr. Morer. Uh, I was just going to say that we don't use hydrogen because it's dangerous, but like on another planet, we could use hydrogen, especially if there was no oxygen around to explode it. Mm -hmm which is an interesting thought. Um, but the thing that's really cool about these balloons for me is that uh, they go a lot higher than we regularly fly. And so if you wanted to do like a low pressure experiment with chemistry, you could and just send it up in the balloon and have it react and then have it come back down and see how. Yeah, and then you don't need to uh, engin an engineering university an engineering budget to uh, send one of these <laughs> into space. So yeah. Um, You are all absolutely amazing. Yes, Daniela. Yeah, these balloons are really very interesting for astrobiology. I know that there have been experiment flying spores of bacteria and other extremophiles and see how they survive in space, you know, because you can use the stratosphere as a Mars analog, you know, and so their experiment on UV radiation resistance. So they're uh, quite uh, an interesting and useful tool to explore the limit of life as we know it. So have congratulations. You any, have you done any experiments or something like that? I, I know you're sort of into uh, this, yeah. <laughs> In the business. No, not with balloons, never, uh, but I've been reading uh, of experiment performed using balloons. On my side, I participated to experiment that uh, have exposed the extremophile outside the International Space Station for one year and a half. 
And now I am also in teams working on experiment to be performed on the moon or on CubeSat. Oh, So, yeah, that's, I think Italy, they just recently launched um, GreenCube, which was done, uh, yeah. really, yeah, they just had the uh, plants on there Yeah, in there is. North orbit, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I am. I know things about life support and experiment using yes plants on the green cube as you just mentioned. Yes, this is an Italian theme, so I'm happy that you know that. <laughs> yeah. Hugo, I think here you have some people who can join your space job platform right away and be hired right away, right? <laughs> Hugo is uh, uh, trying to build a platform that uh, lets uh, companies uh, meet, like uh, hire. like freelance experts in space industry, right? Here you go. Um, so, you're muted, so I couldn't hear you, so I Yes. have to say it for you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I was trying to speak and then I realized I was muted. So yeah, thanks for thanks for that. So we actually, the platform is actually already done. So um, very exciting times. We're about to launch um, next month. Um, so it was, it was supposed to be the end of this month, which is possibly, is still a possibility. Um, and, and yeah, I was just saying before I noticed I was muted that, uh, yeah, there was a lot of bright presentations here and I really enjoy all of them. Um, and totally, I think there's um, that's definitely going to be some possibilities for um, for you know the the future of these astrobiologists to to work and be on the platform for sure. You need to put some internships for high school students on Yes, your yes. So, so that's one of the things we actually already. I don't know if I told you that, but we've already built that feature in. Um, Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that, that feature is actually already built because, again, so we work directly with these companies and, you know, in a lot of situations, I think, um, you know, if we make it um, as easy as possible for them to access the talent share of university, um, I think it will be definitely a benefit. And, you know, instead of them just hiring a very senior person, they can hire a senior person alongside a, a recent graduate. So then, you know, they, they can actually learn with the more experienced engineer, which, um, you know, it's it definitely, This it's is, definitely, you are talking college students. I'm talking high school students, like yeah, the yeah, ones we have here. yeah, yeah, for sure, So, for sure, even, even that, like, graduate, I'm, I'm saying, like, you and know, giving some opportunities for teachers as well to join with their projects, like Daniela, right? yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, again, like, I, you know, I've, I've been speaking, for the ones that you don't know, like, I've been speaking to Julia uh, in order to Um, try to come up with some ideas on how we can actually implement things in our platform that will help, um, you know, students get into the industry easier. Because, you know, unfortunately, the space industry is still um, an industry where the barrier to entry is still quite high. Um, so the work that we're trying to do is to actually decrease that barrier of entry to make it easier for, um, for, for people to access it, basically. So, yeah, that's what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Um, um, Patrick, uh, do you have any comments on any of the um, presentations? Do you want to add something? Do you have any suggestions? Do you want to make something different, you know? Uh, what about you, Samuel? Did No, you enjoy I mean, the presentation? I, I liked all the presentations and if you guys would let me in release the recording, I would like to go more in depth with all these topics because I know some, but I don't know a lot. So Yes, we're I'm going definitely to email out the recording. recording. Uh, we will we will upload it and send it to everyone. Thank you very Absolutely. much. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and Thank just to plug the event tomorrow, there are going to be some experts in the room. So if there's a topic that you want to know more about that you're inspired from, uh, I think we have a page where you can submit pre-submit questions to make sure that we get to yours. Um, so if you want to hear more about um, like planned missions or right, just put it in the questions and we'll make sure that we talk about some more of that tomorrow so that it's part of the programming. Will do, thank you. And um, Dr. Moore, uh, one more thing that you spoke with uh, Daniela and Svetlana, right? Um, 
there for those people who are in Providence, Rhode Island right now, you can actually attend uh, the conference. I think that there's a Wednesday event that is Wednesday sponsored. Mm -hmm. um, and so if anyone is actually in Providence and would like to attend, we have some availability on Wednesday, uh, including free lunch. <laughs> So you can come and uh, hang around, listen to the um, lectures. I'm also working on getting some online um, registration, but I haven't been successful yet, so. Okay, well, thank you so much. I think we had a really good meeting. If anyone has any um, last minute thoughts, comments that you want to say before we- I think before we go, if we could just all uh put our emails in the chat. I think that'll be great, actually. Um, here's mine. Yeah, for sure. I will also add my LinkedIn profile so you guys can add me on LinkedIn. And if you have any questions or if you'd like to ask me anything, just, uh, or if you have any suggestions for the platform as well, feel free to get in touch as well. So there you go. Great. Thank you for coming, everyone. It was really enjoyable to listen to everyone, and I learned a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, it was great, I think. I think for the first thing, I think it was pretty amazing. What do you think? <laughs> we never did it before, and I think we got such an amazing group of people here. I, I am very impressed. And really enjoyed it too. Yeah, I think it was great. All right, unless anybody has some last sentiments to share. Hope to see you all tomorrow. Yes, yeah. we did. Yeah. Uh, we want to say something. I know you volunteered to help us out with this event. Just... It's pretty amazing to see you all here and seeing the enthusiasm, the work that everyone is doing. So uh, I'm really happy and I'm sure I will be meeting you all again and interacting with you more in the future. So yeah, please do stay in touch and we will be discussing more and doing more cool stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Great. See you yeah. all tomorrow. Yes, you're right, Patrick. See you tomorrow. All right, guys, have a great conference. Take Thank care. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 I'm happy to have attended this uh, conference. So congratulations to everyone and have fun tomorrow at the meeting. So bye from Rome. <laughs> bye. Bye. And I will upload the recording soon. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Ah, what just happened? I don't know. It just. <laughs> oh, Earth, I'm back. Okay. I don't know what that was, but it said joining meeting all of a sudden. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> okay, I'm talking to the recording. Yeah. Oh.